for it, but I think he might go into some more details this evening, speaking more of things that swim under the water and things that, you know, are a lot bigger than you under the water as well. So, and Steve will be telling all that. He might be talking a little bit more about Fiji, and then he might have some questions at the end. So if any of you kids or anyone have any questions about, you know, great whites or orcas or anything like that, feel free to ask any questions at the end. And I, we're going to say a quick prayer here. Dear Father, thank you for giving us the Sabbath. Thank you we're here to fellowship together. Thank you we're here about, hear about your creation in the ocean. Please be with Steve this evening as he shares about your creation and your message of love and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If everyone needs to give Steve a little round of applause here. Thank you. Whoa. Um, I want you to know I really love doing this. Okay? Um, when I did that CPR on that young man, when I blew wind into his lungs, and, and then to get that uh, uh, award signed by President Ronald Reagan as an ex-felon, it, it really told me that if, if God could use my breath to save the young man, that then I have to have confidence that he had a plan for me. And this is one of the greatest things in my life, besides my wife, Cindy, sitting right there. Aren't I a lucky guy? Is that I've always known that God has a plan for me. And he's not, he's not done yet. Uh, and it, it, this is a really hard time to be a young person growing up in America. In fact, it's hard to be an adult with all the stuff that's going on in America today. And we, and we really need God in our lives. And... Um, when I speak in public schools, and I, I've done over 4, 000, almost 4,000 public school assemblies, what am I not allowed to talk about? I'm not allowed to talk about Jesus Christ. The most important thing that I can possibly talk to a young person about, I'm not allowed to do it. And if I did it, it would be over. I wouldn't be able to speak in schools anymore. So I share his teachings is what I do. And then I tell him um, at the end of a of a program, I'll say, hey, um, and I'm at a public school, and I'll go, hey, uh, you know what, is this, week, this Saturday, I'm going to be speaking at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Placerville, if you want to come, and, uh, and then you never know who you're going to get. I got a basketball team one time, um, I, you know, I just, you know, kids, they come, and, it, and it's a really good way to do outreach, and in Northern California, um, I have not spoken in any of the Placerville schools. Okay, so I'm taking a moment to share something with you to be aware of it. I have not spoken in a school in Placerville. I've spoken in schools east of you and south of you and north of you. Um, I've spoken in, in Sacramento sc uh, School District. Uh, 20 years ago, they rated me their number one speaker for the county. Um, and so uh, I'm all over and I have tons and tons of references it, and I, I don't overcharge public schools. And so if you get me into public schools in Placerville, then I can get the, uh, you know, let the young people know that I'm going to be speaking here. Now, I see people out in the parking lot coming in. So before I actually start to talk, is there a question somebody would like to ask me? Is there a question just hovering out there? Yes. No, John DeLorean passed away. Um, and he, um, he died a Christian. He, he, he accepted Christianity into his life. Um, and um, I think it's about, I'm not sure, I don't want to say how many years ago, but it was more, more than five or maybe it's eight or years ago that he actually he passed away. There's a Netflix series on John DeLorean on that I'm, I'm actually in part three of it. It's airing right now, and it's called Myth and Mogul. John DeLorean, Myth and Mogul, and it's actually a fascinating documentary, yes? You said you've uh, been in all 49, or 49 states, so what is um, one state you haven't been in? Okay, I've actually been to all the states. Is there's one state I haven't spoken in, yes, yes. and it's South Dakota. <laughs> okay, and the, um, the reason why I like to say that is I hope they don't have me go to South Dakota, <laughs> because then I'll say, well, I've spoken in all 50 states, and they go, everybody goes, so what? But if you say 49, then, then people get interested. One more question? One more quick question? Question, question? Question, question, question? 
and it all sort of like, okay, I'll go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and, and start. I'm going to go for about an hour. I'll, I'll go a little bit less because it's you got rain coming and everything else. Go ahead and put up the first, do I have to push the button to cue the first one? Do I, do I, do I? I will do that. There it is. Um, this is Nasukamai Village. I talked with you this morning about it, and I didn't get to show, this was one, one slide I didn't show there. And you see the, if you, that's the whole, that's just the village itself. But you see that big brown spot up in the upper right corner at one o'clock? That is our property. That is where we're building the uh, entry, um, or the, the clinic, and that road just beneath it. You see the road. So that when you first come into the village, but we actually had to cut a road ourselves to be able to route people in so they came into the back side. And that actually wound up to be a very important thing to do because with things like COVID and stuff like that, they don't want you know, patients walking through the village, if possible. Now, do you want to know what we paid for 2.3 acres? You want to know the price? Okay. Um, and and, and this, is, uh, this is now ours. But when I say it's ours, it's clan land. In Fiji, clan land can never be sold to anyone. It will always belong to the clan. But at the same time, now that I'm a, uh, I'm a chief, you know, remember here, I, I thought I'd never be a chief again, and now I'm a chief for life, and when I pass away, my son will become a chief, and I'm brother to the high chief, uh, and this is a big, big deal in Fiji. It's a really big deal. I have no idea where the Lord's going to take it, but this is, they've never had an adoption of a Caucasian uh, into, into the, a Fiji noble family. This is just like, wow, but... Um, it means that that clinic will always be there because they adopted me, they adopted my wife and my children, and they adopted the DMF, the Dream Machine Foundation, so that we can, under clan, own that property. And so 2.3 acres cost us a bull, 300 pounds of cassava root, um, and wait a minute, there's one other thing, that um, the root, the, the, the cow, what am I missing? Any, anyway, it, huh? No, uh, wow. Anyway, it was, we had to throw a barbecue <laughs> for the price of a, a barbecue for the whole village. Okay, next image, please. Okay, with Cousteau, I got to dive. Oh, that's right. I, I, high technology. Remember, I have not spoke since COVID hit. Um, and so what would you do? What would you do? And you three guys back there, what would you do if you were in the water and you saw that coming at you? What would you do? What? Uh, swim fast. <laughs> no. Well, you can't do it anymore. It's, it's a way, it's, this, is, this shark is harmless. It's a filter feeder. Uh, he, 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 it would never hurt you. It doesn't even want you in, in, in its mouth. However, this is a different scenario. <laughs> I shot this picture from less than three feet away. Less than three feet away. And... I was kneeling down on a swim step. I had, not with both knees, because I had to be able to move. I have one knee down on the swim step, and I have my camera out and pre-focused for two and a half to three feet. And this is the image that I got. And up on top of it, you see that little bit of stuff, that's something funny? Like it's like a snot coming out of a nose, but they don't have noses. Um, that is a piece of bait fish. And so we were lowering the bait into the water, so I knew right where the shark was going to come up. And so I'd shoot the picture, and then I'd move out of the way. And then I got, okay, this is what, what I'm doing. Is you see where they're standing? That's where I was kneeling. I was eight inches above the water. And, um, yeah, and the thing of it is, is we, it was a little bit of a rough day, and so the ship was doing this. And so the water was sloshing across my feet. And so it was really exciting getting these images. And this right here, this cage, this is the world's first all-plastic great white shark cage. And I, the, I ordered the plastic. It's Lexan. I ordered a sheet three-eighths of an inch thick. And the French engineer who ordered it said, oh, you Americans, you are so foolish, huh? What is this barbarous number you have, three-eighths of the inch? You should talk to me in millimeters. He says, I will order it for you in millimeters, no problem. He ordered a sheet three sixteenths of an inch thick. And that's supposed to stop a, a th uh, almost a two, a two and a half, a 2,500 pound super predator. 
Um, this, I got this image. Look, I was trying to recreate the Jaws poster. And when the shark came up out of the water and it slammed in right at my feet, right there, it slammed back in, and the splash soaked me head to toe. But there's something you don't know about in this image. <coughs> if the fish <coughs> had come up and it was, it was hanging from a davit rope, and when it came up, it's swinging. And when it swung, it swung and it landed right at my feet. And when the shark came up, it's going right at where my toes would be. And this is uh, my web page, Drugs Bite. And this is my public school web page. I have another web page. It's <coughs> dreammachinefoundation.org. Like you're dreaming at night, dreammachinefoundation.org. And so if you go to this, you will see some of my videos and such are there. And also, I'm on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and you type in Stephen Arrington, Paradise, California, you can see uh, the various films I have there. And here I am underwater in the plastic cage. Now, do you notice it seems to disappear? The cage? You can see right through it. Um, for me, right, you can see some of the cage because you're looking through two walls or along the side. When you're on the inside looking out, it's like there's no cage at all. It's like there's nothing there. So when the great white shark is doing, uh, getting close, uh, my subconscious is not convinced I'm safe. And this is one coming up from underneath me. She's 17 and a half feet long. Her name's Amy. And the bottom of the cage is hollow plastic tubes. And when she came up with so much speed, she hit the bottom of the cage and she moved it and the pipes separated a little bit and she got her head a little bit inside. And that made me very, very nervous. And she's starting to shake the cage and working her way in. But I had a 25-pound lead weight holding the cage vertical, so in the weight, in the current. And it slid across and hit her in the nose. And she was so offended when she swam away. And um, this one is really interesting. And I'm so glad that my wife, Cindy, is sitting there because she saw this footage. And that is, is that when we were working with the Great Whites, um, I had an instant in time when I'm standing on the back of the boat and I'm, oh, thank you, honey. I appreciate it. Um, I'm standing on the back of the boat and I'm getting ready to jump in the water. And what I do is I stand on the back of the boat and I look for a shark. And if there's no, and I watch out there and if there's no sharks, I can jump. But this day, it was like the express lane for great white sharks. We had eight of them. And so I'm watching, and what I don't know is a shark has swum with, under the back of the Alcyon, the Cousteau research vessel. And it was lingering there, and I didn't see it. And so I look, I don't see a shark, and I put my foot out to jump, and the French chef sees it swimming out from under the boat. And he goes, regard, le regard, which means look the shark, but then he remembers, I don't speak French. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I was in charge of expeditions, and a French crew, and I don't speak their language? I mean, you know, God is so good. And so I leaped, and uh, that's what I saw. I saw that shark. And uh, what's going to come up next? Okay, here's the video of it. Here's the video. And there's sound on that? Conscious is not completely convinced. There's still a cage there, particularly when there's a great white on the other side staring you in the face. That was probably the most exciting moment. What occurs in the brain of such a creature, we can never know. Even in the presence of bait and blood, the great white moves not in mindless fury, but in apparent bewilderment. It does not attack, it inspects. It seems a cautious animal trying to comprehend things it has never seen nor smelled before. in midwater to stare at the unfamiliar creature in its midst. As the shark turned its head from side to side, you could look at the eye and you wonder what's going on there. It was suspended, it was hovering, and when the shark was hugging the cage, that was not a point of fear because 
the shark was not being aggressive. And I, I could see into its mouth, I could see light coming in the gill slits. It was like really curious, like, who are you, what are you? Um, it was like being next to a tiger and not having that tiger actually trying to attack you. It was just looking at you. Another intelligence and being very close. Okay. And, and, there's, and there's the image of me with that shark. And that was an incredible moment. Um, when the shark was chewing on the cage, uh, at, at, right now, this is straight on, but it, when it turned a bit at another time, and it was like this, because of the warp of the cage, I could lean forward into the bite and look down the throat of a great white shark underwater. And I don't think anybody else has ever seen that. Okay, I mean, uh, th this is stuff that, this was over 30 years ago that I did this. And uh, it was just, it's just fantastic stuff. Let's see what's coming up next here. Okay, um, I was in Hawaii. Pr Hawaiians, Hawaiians pronounce it Hawaii. And um, I met a woman who was a missionary to Hawaii when she was a little girl. And the queen of uh, Ho Ho Hawaii, uh, she was no, she, it had been taken over by the United States, but she was raised in the royal court. And a lot of the way that you were taught things about the, about the world of Hawaii is, is that you would do it with a hula, because a hula would tell a story. And this lady who's in her late 90s, she had a cane, and she, I asked her, Can you, do, is there any relationship between hump, uh, humpback whales and dolphins? And she said, oh, yes, oh, yes. She says, the, the humpback and the dolphin, the dolphins are the protectors. And she set her cane down. She said, the dolphins are the protectors of the whales. And then she danced a hula of the dolphins protecting the whales. And here's what happens. Is when a humpback or any whale gives birth, but particularly humpbacks, when they give birth, fluids wind up in the water that have an odor of a birthing. And it attracts sharks. And when the sharks get, are swimming and they encounter the smell, they'll encounter it in what's called the odor corridor. And so they'll go up that older corridor back and forth tracking. And I believe they can tell the difference between fish blood and orca blood. Uh, it's just like if you go buy a fast food and you smell French fries, you know, you, you know those are French fries. I think they know that it's a whale. And if it's a whale, it means it's a feast for everybody, so rush. And when they get there, they will attack a newborn calf. They'll attack it and kill it. Because the big whales can't do anything about it. But the dolphins come in and they ring the calf and the cow to protect it. And they quickly move to a new location. Uh, and and that, this is how they save the calves. And so he, with whales, back then, you held your breath. They have very sensitive hearing. And so your scuba regulator <laughs> is too much noise for them. And they'll leave. So if you want to dive with, back then with humpback whales, you had to hold your breath. So you take a really, 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 really deep breath after maybe two or three, and then you dive down about as deep as the ceiling is tall, and then you get your camera, and you're looking to see what you see. And what I saw, that's the, the nose, the beginning part of a humpback whale with three dolphins in front of it. What do I think is going on? What do I think is in the water? Sharks! This, there could be sharks in the water. What happens to my heartbeat? I don't have a scuba tank. I'm free diving, which means I, I'm, I, I can't stay in a defensive mode. I have to move. And so I'm a little bit nervous right now about sharks. And then as I'm filming with my still camera, taking still pictures, now that they pass on, and now you can see the humpback eyes. The eyes of those humpback whales are the size of softballs. And now I'm still holding my breath, and as I'm holding my breath, Two dolphins broke off, and they swam around me. They swam around me, and I got, I got this picture right there. And that was super, super cool. And I remember I'm still swimming, and I'm holding my breath, and suddenly I see a baby whale. Now, we know the humpback. Her name is Daisy. We know her by the colorations. Look at the stuff on her nose and stuff. This is Daisy. She's a diver-friendly whale, and she has approached me, and she's showing, she's showing off her baby. I mean, that's how I see it. She's showing off a brand new baby. And I'm shooting pictures of this brand new baby, and suddenly bubbles start coming up.
between the baby and I. These bubbles are the size of basketball, some of them. And I look down, and th there's a bull, humpback whale, and he's blowing a stream of bubbles, warning me away. He doesn't want me around his, his, the calf and the cow. Actually, it's the calf, or the cow he's concerned about. And so this is a threat from an animal that weighs about 45 tons. Okay? So now what is my heartbeat doing? I'm, I'm worried about sharks. I'm worried about a 45-ton bull whale that's, kind of, that's mad at me. And I look back up, and the calf is now swimming straight towards me. And this is when I real, I have, realize I have another problem. There's a cinematographer in the water with a big 35-millimeter camera, and the Cousteau films are the meat and potatoes of money-making for, for the dream machine for uh, Cousteau Society. And his footage is far more important than I, mine, and I'm not even in Cousteau silver. I'm wearing a regular wetsuit. You know why I have to, I'm not in a silver wetsuit? because they would get sunburned in the sun and turn yellow. And so we would put suntan lotion on our silver wetsuits. And people say, why did Cousteau have the silver wetsuits? And Jacques Cousteau said, well, I could say that it is because then we looked like the fish, huh? And we can get closer, but it's not true. We wear the silver wetsuits because they look fabulous, huh? huh? <laughs> so anyway, I now have this new problem with this guy's filming, and I know he's, this, he's in, he's filming the same thing I am, and I'm about to ruin a shot so I start swimming backwards as fast as I can, and the baby humpback follows me. And now I've been swimming underwater, full speed, 50 seconds. I'm out of breath. I have to go up. And so I go up for a breath of air, and the baby follows me, the calf. She is not five feet from me. Now, there's something about a brand new baby whale. It is the, the rarest picture you can basically get in the water uh, of a humpback. And uh, whoever gets the first picture of a baby humpback gets to name it. Okay, it's your, it's your humpback. This is the first picture of that baby whale. Now, um, we got to the surface. She took one breath. I took about 20. But next time it went down and it came up, we had a... Uh, a woman who was a marine biologist, uh, and she, we were operating under her permit, and then she shot a picture of the whale, and she got a picture of the baby, and then she came up to me, and I'm gonna have another question for you boys in a second. She came up to me and she said, Stephen, I know you got the first picture, but that's my whale, it's not yours. <laughs> what did I say to her, you three gentlemen? What did I, what was my response, what did I say? What do you think? Yeah, like that. No, oh, that's my, it's my whale, huh? Yeah, sound like that? Um, I said, of course it is. Why? Because she's a marine mammologist and, and working with whales, and they were on her permit, and she had been working with them for 20 years, and she never got a shot of a brand new baby whale, and this is a career thing for her. And by my saying, of course it is. She ha I had a new best friend. And what did I say earlier? You always do, is be you know, do good things for other people and other th good things will happen to you. And look who's still with me. The bulls right underneath me. And this is them swimming away. There goes the calf. And then we moved our zodiac. We got ahead of them and they, she came to us again. Oh, wait, still swimming away. There, look at this. And as I'm filming this, I want you to know the whales are singing. The bulls are singing. And the, the sound is so intense that when you're this close to the whales, it vibrates off your skin. And it's like being in the, in the bass tube of a cathedral organ. Um, and then this is uh, Fiji. Uh, and this is the video footage of Fiji. I'm going to let this run for a, a little bit. Uh, when I went out to Batavona School in Fiji and started filming there. Oh, it stopped right there. Um, this school was going to be sold. This school was, was on the market. And I want you to know how Lord works. Is, is um, When I came back, they were going to sell that school. And these are clinics that we do. 
and, and we go off to other villages and we, we see people. We've, we've treated uh, 30-something thousand Fijians for free and, it's, and going on 24 years. And in doing all of this, um, when we, that one school that was going to be sold, it was going to be sold. You know what? Would you go ahead and just take it forward to when you see underwater footage? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let this play. I'll let this play. This boy, he fell out of a tree and broke his leg. And the bone, oh, keep the sound down. And the bone came out, and his leg was going to be amputated by the Fiji government. But his uncle knew that we had a clinic there, and we had, an, a, we had a, a physician, and so they brought him to our clinic, the little clinic that we had, and uh, they did uh, emergency surgery in Fiji, and then we did another surgery in the United States, and then we sent him back. And then I sent all the kids after him. I said, run. And they all ran. And he is outrunning the whole school. And watch this one kid. He cheats. He cuts across. See that? He didn't run the whole length. And he's after my guy. And my guy makes it. He outruns. The, another cheater coming in, see? But he outruns every, all of them. And all he has to do is cross that line right there. Just that he just made it. Isn't that cool to see a kid run? When you are doing mission work, when you are doing God's work, this little girl... She's, I mentioned her this morning. Her, she has such a bad spine issue that she will die because she won't be able to breathe. She will not be able to stand up. She won't be able to breathe. She wants to see an elephant more than anything else in the whole world. And I'm going to show you just a little bit of footage of her um, when she comes back. So there she is. She's less than five years old. I think she's like four or three. I'm not sure. And that's Roger Lutz, our project manager in Fiji. And we're just talking about her. But I want you to see her just a little bit older. This is the stuff that impacts you for a whole lifetime. I'll never forget this young lady. Okay, and now she's like 20 years old. Here she is. She's, now she's had her first surgery. And look at her. Look at she's growing up. Okay, would you take it forward and just look for underwater footage of uh, fish and stuff like that? Uh, we didn't have time to completely get this set up. Does anybody want to qu ask me a question while they're taking it forward? Whoa, yeah, cool. Yes, sir. How do you know what the lady is wearing? I don't know. I, that's one of the most uh, asked questions, and I've lost track of her. I don't know what, the question, what it was. Is there a question over there? I saw it. Yes. That was my question, too. See? See, it's a popular question. I don't know. I don't know. That was, oh, there we are. You're there. You're there. Underwater, young people, your mind and your bodies are your adventure machine. All the adventure you will ever know in life and will include your mind and your body. And you've got to take care of them. You know, people think about a motorcycle or something. No, it's your body and your mind. And as we go underwater here, you'll, some of the fish you'll see may be upside down because there's no gravity. And you can just, you can float, you can sink, and you encounter all this beautiful stuff. Um, Oh, you know what? You told me you wanted me to stand on the platform, didn't you? And I didn't do it. Oh, well. Okay. I've, I've done this before. Um, lionfish. And it's going to be joined by a second lionfish. And then you're going to see a third lionfish. Um, Fiji, the diving in Fiji is absolutely phenomenal. It's incredible diving. Um, as like I mentioned earlier, that is the soft coral capital of the world. Uh, this cave right here is part of the white wall of uh, a Rainbow Reef, and it is one of the top dive sites on the entire planet. And this is amazing. This is where God sent me to do mission work. And so here they go. You know, I'm going to ask you to go fast. Well, because I want to show you a few other things here. And I'm looking at the clock. We're doing, we're doing great on time. Is there any way we could dim the lights right above those? So we get the real, because I see the, co the colors are, in, are intense. Does it make, does that make a difference for you guys to see? Because I, I really want you to see the beauty of all of this. Excellent. And I want to see what's coming up next because I want to get... Um, this is just going into a cave. You know, see, see the bubbles coming up? What you do is you have your diver go under coral, the type of coral that's laced that goes out, and they, they blow bubbles, and then they come up like little bubbles like this. And it, it gives you a, a little curtain effect that we're just kind of creating. This is a lady that came down with us on a mission trip. She is no longer with us. 
to some Sacramento. And, uh, you know, you, you, you don't know what's going to happen in life. There's a fish hiding under a rock. Look up there. You can't see it. Yeah, there it is. He's a grouper. He's a very good tasting fish. He knows he has to leave. Now, look, look at the fish upside down. Look at this. This is Rainbow Reef White Wall. It's called the White Wall. And this is right outside where our mission is. And so we have attracted people to come out, uh, some of the top surgeons and uh, uh, oral surgeons, dentists, um, anesthesiologists. We, had, we attracted uh, Richard Zumwalt, who's sitting back there. Uh, we've got Michael, uh, not Michael, Michael, and Jonathan's been out there. And this is just like, it's just like swimming along a wall. Okay, I'm going to have us go fast forward a little bit because you can look at beautiful footage, but it can get boring, and I don't ever like to be boring. So just hit the fast forward button, and I'll ask you to stop, okay? Question why this is happening. Who wants to ask a question? Any question? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. We're going to go. Keep go, 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 go. Where, huh? Where did I meet my wife? Okay, give me a second. I met her at the Cousteau Society. Her brother bought her, brought her down. Um, and he brought her down. Oh, 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 oh. Look at this. That is, go ahead, hit play. This, if he bites you, you're dead in three minutes. Your blood coagulates. Now, I'm filming him. He's, he's, a, he's a huge one. He's a huge sea snake. And um, you, you do not want to be on the business end of this guy. Uh, three minutes to four minutes, you're dead. Your blood coagulates and your heart can't pump. So I'm, I'm being very respectful. I'm keeping my distance from him. I don't, I don't want to get too close. And now, here he is. So I, I, I'm about three feet away. Well, two feet away. All right, two feet away. But it's a careful two feet. Um, <laughs> and, and now one foot, one foot. I got the camera right next to him. I'm so happy. This is so, much, this is so cool. And I'm getting all this close-up footage and I'm going, yeah, he's looking for crustaceans to eat in, in, the, in there, and little fish, anything small that he can eat. Because he can't eat big things, he's a small amount. And there he is. And, um, well, right at, at this moment right here, this is Steve swimming backwards as fast as he can. Okay, look at that. Isn't that cool? Uh, so while you look at the beautiful footage right there of, of Fiji, um, I was working late at the Cousteau Society office, and Cindy's brother, older brother, worked with us there. And he brought her in to see the Cousteau Society, and he brought her in at like 9.30 at night, hoping nobody would be there. He didn't want her to meet any of the French divers. Instead, she met me, and for me, it was love at first sight. And um, I, just, I just fell in love with Cindy, and I really I wanted to get to know her better and everything. And so, oh, this is a flatworm, and it flies. You ever seen a flatworm fly? You know, there are seven times more different types of fish and crustaceans and such than there are animals on, this, on, in the, on land. And watch, he's going to go scare some fish. Being underwater, if you're, if you're calm and you, t and you take your time, you're going to see just incredible, incredible things. Okay, let me see what comes up next. Oh, this is a decorator crab. He takes a piece of coral and he puts it on his back, and it's because he's so good looking. Yeah, see, everybody wants to eat him, and so he puts it on his back. And he's kind of a fat guy. And look, look, watch. When he stops, you wouldn't even know he was there. This is the most beautiful coral head I have ever filmed. Look, as the tide moves, it's like the reef is breathing. See that? <gasps> and then, <sighs> and the colors, the colors are phenomenal. Um, this is in, inside the reef. And doesn't that look like cotton candy? And it's, it's, just, it's just stunningly beautiful. And I know that after this clip, I'm going to have something I want to talk about. So I'm going to let it run. It runs for a little while. I was, I was so pleased with my camera to have captured this. And the nice thing about filming underwater is you don't need a tripod. Uh, you can go any angle that you, you might want to grab in order to film these you know, incredible sea life and such. And these are some of, those are the soft corals that you encounter there. And I'm just waiting for it to pass out. Oh, watch this. This school of fish passing behind the diver. He doesn't know it. And what they're doing is they're coming to me because they're being pursued by predators. And so they're trying to hide behind me. And this goes on for like half an hour. That these, this whole school of little fish are being pursued. And I'm, I'm their protector. And then this, look at this. This whole school of fish going up. These are uh, French legionnaire fish. 
Look how many there are. I want to show you some more of the fun uh, things that we get to do in Fiji. And Cindy, you're, gonna, you're in this. Yeah, get ready. So are you, Barb, just so you know it's coming. So I should probably, okay, these are the water slides of Fiji. And that was my oldest daughter. There's my son, Chase, who's now six and a half feet tall plus. He's six foot seven. And here comes Cindy. Now, Cindy's a total athlete. I want to prove to you what an athlete she is. Watch, watch this. Dry hair. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Uh huh. And there's my daughter, Cheyenne. She's at the very top. Cheyenne participates. I've raised my kids, and Cindy and I, we raised our kids to be athletes. Cheyenne films for Red Bull, and she was in Bosnia, France, Italy, Ireland, all filming for Red Bull, just this all last month and the month before. Here comes Cindy. Now, she's going to hit a rock. He, the, I don't hear the sound, but right there, see, watch, ouch, that was the rock, see it? And this, the Fijians being able to stand up and surf this is phenomenal stuff. Fijians are amongst the happiest people on the planet. They are so friendly. They're friendliest people on the planet. When you meet them, they want to talk to you. They want to know about you and who you are. Also, they, when they heard that, seven, that Christians do circumcision, they were excited because they do circumcision. And when they came over, they used to be called the Cannibal Isles. And when they came over, when the missionaries came over, they were greeted with open arms because the Fijians believe that there is one God in heaven. And so basically 100% of the Fijians, indigenous Fijians, <clears throat> are Christian. Different denominations. Cindy had never eaten a pepper before, nor had Barb Zumwalt. So you're going to see them eating a pepper for the very first time in their lives. Watch this. Yeah. Little tiny pepper, that's no big deal. It's just <laughs> I don't know if we have sound on this. I don't know if, if it... Um, when our house burned, I lost so many things. Okay, um, yeah, I'll tell you about this. This, this could be interesting. Um, the islands are being plowed, mining, all this stuff going on. This was a paradise. This was an island paradise. And they have found gold here. They have found gold. And so their, their rainforest is being knocked down, and they're going to mine the gold. And the, the, the villagers who own that area, they sold it for money, and they really wanted money. And this reef right offshore, you saw how lush they are that I've already been showing you? This should be lush and full of life. Look at it. Th this is a graveyard. There is one tiny fish there only. And um, you're gonna, I'm going to have you pause it at a certain time. Be ready for pause if we're lucky. These men are carrying money from the selling the gold mine. What are they going to do with that money? Those are coins that they're carrying. They're carrying some Papua New Guinea. They're carrying coins to buy something. And if you laughed at them, if you laughed at them dressed like that, those spears would be in your chest. And here they're carrying in all these coins because they're going to buy a truck because of the prestige of having the truck. But they don't know about changing oil. They don't know about taking care of spark plugs. And I would imagine the truck will probably last for about a couple of months, and then it'll be rotting out in the desert. I mean, out in the jungle. And they have traded, they have traded the heritage for their kids. And when you bring in money, and everybody, everybody gets crazy about what they're going to do. This is a research vessel, Alcyon. And this is another place where it's just you go in and you have devastation. This is Nauru Island. And it's, it's just horrible what has happened to so many of these islands. And it, and it continues to happen as, you know, today. There's, there's no stop. See, there's one fish, one fish. Now, what's happening here? is they want money, they need money. So in order to get money, they did dynamite fishing. They'd throw dynamite into the water and it would blow a part of the reef. Um, and then the fish would go belly up and they would collect all the fish. And this is where it came from. And this is one of the fishermen who did it. 
And you notice he doesn't have a right hand because of an explosion. And this was left over from World War II. This, this is... Uh, the, we were very interested in all the things that were so devastating people uh, in the South Pacific Islands. That's Clay Wilcox, one of our divers. Okay, and we'll stop right there. Okay, well, no, I'm not going to get into that. Um, what I do is I speak in, I'm done with video. I want to, I want to talk to people for a little while. Um, we're not going to use any more video, okay? Uh, what this is, this is a scene from a, a film that has bad connotations for kids uh, made by people who make films for kids. And uh, it's hard to be a young person growing up in America today. It's hard to be an adult living in America with all the stuff that's going on. And unfortunately, families are on the front lines of all of this. I was speaking at the Camelback Seventh-day Adventist Church in Arizona. And they told me that, um, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, I'm going to give it just a second. Cindy, we just talked about this. It, the rest of the story by... Paul Harvey. They said Paul Harvey is probably, he attends this church. He attends that church. And his wife's name's Angel. She's a Seventh-day Adventist. Paul Harvey wasn't. And they said, we do not acknowledge him from the pulpit. Okay, Steve? So if he's there, don't acknowledge him from the pulpit. And uh, I was speaking, and it came upon me to acknowledge him. And this is, this is what I did. Is I said, when you look at movies today, and they show grandparents in films. What is universally true about who they show? They're not shown as the fonts of wisdom for children, of, of carrying on the heritage. They're usually ridiculed. They're shown to be a bit foolish and doing crazy things. You see it all the time in films. Just pay attention and look and you will see it. And it used to be when kids were growing up in the older times, grandma and grandpa probably lived in the same house as the kids. And now what we have is grandma and grandpa live in one town or one state or on the west coast and the east coast and you don't have that font of wisdom growing up with the young people. And I said, Mr. Harvey, I'm sorry to pay attention, you know, bring this to, your, to you, but I have to tell you something. You are the font of wisdom, the grandfather for millions of kids across the United States and probably around the world by what you share and what you teach. And children are on the front lines for all the things that are wrong in America. They're right there. They're on the front line. And they, they're, they're there. And so are you. And so am I. And we have to protect our kids. And I said, what you do is so incredibly wonderful, and thank you for doing it. And then I closed with a prayer, and I walked to the back of the church, you know, to shake hands as people come out. And Paul Harvey, who does not want to be noticed in church, was wearing an electric blue sport coat. And he jumped up, and he, he was in his late 80s, and he, did, he ran at me. And it was, you know, it was kind of a, an older person running, and he ran up, and he grabbed my hand, and he shook it. And he said, Stephen, he said, I've got to tell you that they asked me to renew my contract, and I was done. I don't need any more money. I wanted to retire, but something made me sign that contract, and now I know why. It's for the children, and all of us have these incredible opportunities to do good work. Um, for Cindy and I, we have our foundation in Fiji, and we work with kids there. And those kids are challenged also. The kids who live in the bush, things are changing in Fiji. You know what's changing them? The corner store, selling candy, soda pop. And they're, they're gaining weight. And in the bush, the, you know, they've been happy in the bush. And when Cindy and I first went over to call, when we were in the villages, in the rural villages, they wanted to get Cindy's attention, and so they called her. They, they called out. And, and they, ha they, st they started calling other villages and, and have her look for him. You know how they did it? Beating on a hollow log. Ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum. It's like a telegraph. And went from village to village, and finally Cindy came walking up, and they said, where have you been? We've been calling you on the lolly. 
But now, they have, they have cell phones. They have cell phones with video games on them. And the kids are eating sugar, lots of sugar, and corn syrup and synthetic stuff. And now, one of the number, there's two big killers in Fiji right now, two big killers. One of them is suicide. The other one is diabetes. And they're regularly doing um, surgeries in the government hospitals, amputating limbs because people have they've gotten away from the roots and the fibers and the fruits that they eat. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not done. I'm, I'm done showing you video. I want to talk with you. Um, but also what we're going to do is we're going to be taking an offering. The offering supports our work in Fiji. Um, no salary is pay, paid to anybody here in the United States. No benefits. Um, this, all, this, all the money goes to Fiji, except for our operation costs. We have to have insurance and stuff, things like that. But um, this is the first offering I've been able to take since COVID. Okay? We're getting along. Uh, we're, you know, we have people who are longtime supporters and help us to grow. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a prayer for the offering. And then I'm going to open up the floor to questions and how long we go, because it's eight minutes till seven. How long we go will be determined by you, by the questions that you ask. Okay? And then, um, well, let's, let's do the prayer. Dear Father, Father, this offering is your offering. I ask you to bless it and like the bread and the fish to make it go so very, very far to change the lives of the Fijians, to help the families. Um, I appreciate that you give me this opportunity to do this work. And all this we do in Jesus' name, amen. And while we're taking the offering, I'm going to take questions. Oh, if you're going to write a check, you make it to the Dream Machine Foundation, D-R-E-A-M, machine, like you're dreaming at night. And you will get a tax. We are a 503 nonprofit, Charlie. And so you will get a tax receipt for your offerings. And we've been doing this now for 24 years. And I need to tell you something. Waisea Vuniwa, the president of the Fiji Mission, remember I told you that the school was going to go up for sale because they couldn't afford to pay for the school? He gave me a, a price. He said, Steve, if you can raise this much money and send it to me within a month, we will not close that school. We will not close the school if you can raise that money. I went to a church in um, Chico, California. We didn't have many more people than there are here. This is a very nice turnout, just so you know it. And um, after the offering was taken, I paid for a cashier's check. I paid for airmail to Fiji. And I reached in my pocket, and I only had pocket change left over. It was the exact amount of money necessary to save that school. And the result is... We didn't save a school, we saved six schools. Because the Fiji mission was $1.2 million in debt. And they, they, didn't, they didn't see how they could possibly pay it. But what Waisea says is that I was the spark. For that one moment, it wasn't me, it was the, Ch the Chico Church. We raised the exact amount of money to save that school. And because of that, people got busy and we were continuing to raise funds. And we actually saved six schools, six Seventh-day Adventist schools that were going to close. You never know, you know, what is going to happen in mission work. Okay, questions? Yeah. Yeah, oh, whoa, yes. Who said yeah? Yes. How deep are you diving for your best fish? Well, your best fish is closer to the f surface for lighting, but I would take lights and go down. But it's, it's this side of 100 feet. But, you, you know, you can go deeper than that. But um, I, I don't like to go too deep because it's, it's very stressful on the body. Yes? Um, what was your favorite thing you did for Jacques Cousteau? Jacques Cousteau. For Jacques Cousteau, huh? <laughs> um, the very favorite thing I did, eat. Uh, we, uh, they, we, they, they paid us small salaries, and we always had a four-star French chef on board. And, and the food was absolutely phenomenal. Um, swimming with lava underwater, um, that, that was pretty cool. And, um, you know, it, it's just that there's so much adventure and the camaraderie. And, and another, another moment you might like is, you know what we used to love to do? Is, is we used to like to watch the Cousteau documentaries. Because we'd be in them. And they'd be going, hey, Stephen, are you not eating too much food in that film, huh? <laughs> okay. You know what they used to love to do with me? 
because I was in charge and I don't speak French, is they would uh, tease me. Uh, they would, when we'd be eating, they'd be, eat, they'd be speaking in French, and suddenly I'd hear my name and everybody would look at me and laugh. <laughs> yes, what's your question? How long, did you live on the boat? How long did I live on the boat? Normally we'd go on for a couple of months, but uh, Cindy, the first year of our marriage, how long was I home? Maybe four months. Oh, not even that, yeah, yeah, at the most. No, it was more like two and a half months that I was home. Because I was, I, was I was being sent all over the world. Uh, flying teams, so where we fly to where we go, yes? Quick question. Number one, uh, how often do you go to Fiji now? And is there a school in your village? Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, you know what? Um, okay, I'm not sure we'll be able to pull it up. There was one video clip I didn't show. Is it too late to ask for it? It says Fiji fundraiser. And it's just a little video clip. It's only two minutes long. Um, our village is the most remote village in Fiji, uh, on the big island of Viti Levu. And uh, there's no school there. Uh, so the parents teach the kids. Uh, but in order for them to go down to where there's a real school, the parents become squatters. If they don't have a relative that they go live with, they become squatters. And they, they basically camp so their kids can go to school. And in rural Fiji, in the eighth grade, uh, yes, oh, and there's music to this, so bring up the music. This is the village of Nasukamai, in the inland of Ra province in Fiji. Our village people here Oh, you just restarted it. It's okay. It's like... This is the village of Nasukamai in the inland of Ra province in Fiji. Our village people here have to travel a long distance There's our to clinic reach site. the nearest hospital. The road is very rough. It will take them about three hours. Three hours to get to the hospital. To reach that hospital. Sometimes people are moving out from the village to go to the next town in Rakiraki to go and be squatters there just to find places for their children to be educated and to be close to medical care. Thank you so much again to Dream Machine Foundation for their intention to help our people in the inland of Vitileu with uh, regards to putting up a medical clinic to care for our people. Thank you, Vinak. Okay. Vinak means thank you very much. Now, Uh, yeah, this is, this is the most sacred village in Fiji. Uh, see, this mountain, when Fijians first came to, they weren't Fijians, when the, uh, the settlers came in the big war canoes and they landed here, nobody was here. And they went, they went to the mountain, the tallest mountain, uh, and the high chief, uh, the Nusukamai, nobody can have a village above his village. That, that's, nobody can bathe in the stream above it. And the water is so incredible our neighboring property, our neighbors, are somebody called Fiji Water. That's where that's harvested. But it's harvested way down here towards the coast. Um, what it does is it comes down through the tallest mountain, or it's an extinct volcano. It takes 400 years for the water to filter all the way down. And then it comes out as an underground stream above Misukamai Village. And that is the best water you'll ever taste on this planet. Because there's very little pollution in Fiji. 
They, they do have gold mining, but they're being very careful about it. Okay, a couple more questions? A couple more questions? Yes. No, well, that's French Polynesia, so that'd be like Tahiti and such. Uh, Fijians speak their, their own language, but they realized that they needed to come into the 21st century. So when we first went there, um, you, you, only a few kids could speak English. Now it has become the official language, and all the young people speak English. And, and the older people are you know, having to deal with it, but they are in transition, so there's something very really cool. Yes, sir? What, what is the name of the town? Who? Nisukamai? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, our, my last name now is uh, Buniwa, and that means root. But now I'm going to have to ask, because it's, it's the big war clan. I mean, it's the number one war clan that was never defeated. So that's really important. There was a question over here. Another question? Another question? Another question? Okay, yes. Uh, with Cousteau, it was all open circuit, but now it's all, so much it was closed circuit, mixed gas diving and everything else. We're back in the uh, regular type of diving. In fact, I, now you g gave me one last thing i got to share with you. I tell young people, I tell them this, this is important. Have you guys heard the expression, if opportunity knocks, open the door? Okay, I hate that expression. Okay, opportunity does not normally come up to your door and knock. And if, if you're home playing video games, there's no opportunity for you at all. Uh, you, you have to be. You have to go out and look for opportunity, and um, I wanted to do some work when I got out of prison. I was working in the College Oceaneering. I wanted to do some work in the movie industry, and so I was sending out my feelers, and I got a job. Um, how many of you have seen a movie? It's it's not a very big movie. It's called Top Gun. Okay, they had a technical breather because Tony Scott wanted the breathing to have the mechanical sound of a regulator inside of a compressed environment of a, of a jet. And so you'd get a <gasps> type breathing, and they had a technical breather, the, a union guy that they hired to do it, and he, he breathed uh, about two minutes of film, and he hyperventilated and passed out and put an end to their shooting. And so I was at the College of Oceaneering, and Tony Scott said, I need a professional. So they called the College of Oceaneering, and he asked me, they asked if I could do the breathing, mimic this, and I go, yes. And so I go walking onto the set in a sound stage, and I'm carrying a 1944 deep sea diving helmet, a brass helmet with a, the big heavy one, and I hung it under a ladder, and I, I went inside it with a scuba regulator, and the, the people were kind of laughing, is this going to be any good? And I watched all the fighting scenes of Top Gun through a deep sea diving helmet faceplate. And um, the breathing, the... Um, these, that, that film won the Best Sound Editing Academy Award. The theme song is You Take My Breath Away. Isn't this cool stuff? And I'll tell you something else about the movie Top Gun. Is the, the woman who won the Academy Award at this, she listened to F-14s at full war throttle. And she said, they're boring. It's too consistent of sound. So what she did is she edited it in. The sounds of lions roaring, of gorillas growling, of monkeys screeching, and these are sounds that we know, and they're woven into the high, into the film to make you more anxious. Isn't that cool? Okay, um, I, I will show you how I do support my family, kind of, is I have a book and a video. I actually have more books and more videos, but they burned in the fire. So this is my completely updated book. It's called In DeLorean's Shadow, because I was in its publicity shadow. This is full of pictures and images. And um, when I went to trial, John DeLorean was very scared that he was going to be going to prison for a long time. And so he spent a ton of money investigating the FBI, the DEA, the Department of Justice, me, the man I worked for, uh, jo uh, James Hoffman, the, the uh, informant. And my boss cooperated against me, okay? The guy I worked for cooperated against me. Um, but what I told the judge is I will, I, will te I will testify against myself, but not against anybody else. And you know why? When you testify against a, a, another person in, in, in a criminal case, you're damaging their family. And they didn't need my testimony. They knew what had happened. They had it all. They just wanted to nail John DeLorean. So John DeLorean... 
he gave my attorney all his secret files. I have all the secret files from the DeLorean case that never came out, all the things that were never known, and it's all in my book. It's in here. And this book, what it is, is in DeLorean's Shadow, The Drug Trial of the Century by the Soul Surviving Defendant. This is an award-winning book. It's won major awards. And uh, reviews are saying this should be a, a motion picture. This should be a movie. If you go on to Amazon, and you, that's where you, you can get the book on Amazon, you'll see the reviews. And just go, just go down. They're mostly five-star, and they're talking about this needs to be a movie. And the only reason it isn't a movie yet is because I have one criteria. This is a book about Jesus Christ. It's not about a felon. It's not about it's about hope that never surrenders in Jesus Christ. And if you can't tell the story of the wonder and the blessings of Jesus in somebody's life, then you don't get to produce my movie. And so in God's time, in God's time, this will become a movie. Um, but like I say, it's, 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 I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, I think I took uh, 20 years to write this book, honey. <laughs> Something like that. And then I have a, it's called Journey to Darkness. This is a DVD that, that tells my story. Uh, and I'm going to have those over there. And so I'm going to do a, I'm going to close with a prayer. Is there a last question that wants to be said before I go over there and offer books and videos? <gasps> do I need, yes. Fiji, good question. Do I, is it mar, mar, multiple islands in Fiji? Fiji has um, uh, 300 islands. 125 are inhabited. Um, and the Dream Machine Foundation, when we got started 24 years ago, and then the, the Tuvu Foundation, the Tuvu Creek Foundation with that beautiful $5 million clinic, they got started up. And then we've had two more foundations grow out of the Dream Machine, and they're all on different islands. And so there's four foundations that are working in Fiji, and all of them have accepted, uh, if, if they're working with us, that everything is free. You don't charge, okay, because uh, the, the blessing, the thing about blessings is they go both ways. What is a ble what the blessing, the Fijians say, how could, you, how could we equal what you, go, you save our children's lives? You, you give us opportunities, how could we equal that? And I say, well, you know, suicide's really big in the United States. And a lot of our kids are, you know, they're, they're not sure if they're loved. And they may don't have a mom and dad at home, just maybe a mom. And uh, it's tough. And so when we bring them here and you just show them so much love, that invigorates our kids. And I cannot begin to tell you how many young people who came to Fiji on a mission trip went back to become a physician or a nurse or a dentist because of what they did. And they want to, they want to give back to island people. Amen. So this is, you know, the blessings are phenomenal. Okay, I'm going I'm to close with prayer now. Dear Father, Father, it's been a long time since I've been able to speak in a church. And this church has been particularly good to me. We've, we've, we have, we've had a lot of people, and um, it, the times are struggling and we, when we need hope. And you, you've given me the message of hope that never surrenders, hope in Jesus Christ that never surrenders. And you've, you've blessed me in wonderful ways, and you found me in a prison cell. And there's so many times that I should have died, and yet you saved me. And um, I know that you want to save every person here. You want them all to have a wonderful path in life and to have the opportunity to do good work. I ask you to bless all of us to open doors so that we can have an impact on others, particularly on children. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Steve. Well, I'm just here to remind you one last time about the car meet tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and then Steve is speaking for a third time. And there's little pieces of the story he hasn't told, it, and it'll be at 3 o'clock tomorrow. So I encourage you to get his book. I've read his book. He actually has written other books, too, and I've read, I think, all but maybe one of them. So it's very well done. Also, if you're a Kindle person, it's available on Kindle on Amazon. So... But I think that book is a, little, is a little newer than the Kindle version, and so there's some pieces of it, and Christ is intertwined into the book a little bit better. So thank you for coming out tonight, and hopefully we can see you guys tomorrow.